All right. Well, <clears throat> I have the dreaded preprandial geriatric emergency medicine slot here. Uh, but then I was thinking about that. I was thinking, wow, you could say dreaded and then whatever time frame and then geriatric emergency medicine talk and it would be pretty much, I have the dreaded morning geriatric emergency medicine talk, the postprandial geriatric emergency medicine talk. So um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible and let you guys get to lunch a little bit early. <clears throat> So my name is Amar Aldine. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of US Acute Care Solutions. I uh, get to, to work uh, very closely with Ross Berkeley and John Bedoya and Dusty and several of the other folks in our group. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about geriatric emergency medicine. Uh, I worked a lot on geriatric ED projects uh, when I was at Northwestern. Um, we had a grant from CMS to work on that, so I'm very, very, very committed to working on, on geriatric ED stuff. And it, I, I'd love to hear from you offline after this about what you guys are doing to improve geriatric uh, care in your uh, various departments. So, what we're gonna talk about today, five cases. We always learn better with cases, and that's what we're gonna do today. Five cases, wanna uh, use those cases to illustrate some very important geriatric EM pearls, stuff you can take back to your practice, stuff will reduce your risk and improve the care of the patients. And then I did wanna talk a little bit about some amazing older adults, because I think uh, geriatric patients sometimes get shunted to um, uh, areas that, that we don't think routinely about how great they are, how great they have been, and uh, you know, the, the uh, older adults have done some pretty amazing things, so I just wanted to talk about that. So hopefully this will get you to remember some of these pearls a little bit better. Let's talk about nomenclature to start with. So again, so we're on the same page. 65 and older, geriatric. That's what counts as geriatric according to CMS. Now, the best terms to use, senior, older, adult, I think the term geriatric is fine. Um, and uh, what's really not that cool is elderly, uh, which, which is used often in the literature, but uh, older adults don't like it, and old, just plain old doesn't, doesn't work either. And just remember this, 66-year-olds don't think that they're geriatric, right? When you have a young geriatric, they don't actually think of themselves as geriatric. They think of those as, those are the real old people, I'm, I'm still young. So just remember that when you're talking to those folks. So, um, okay, case number one. You have a 75-year-old with left leg pain. These are real cases. 75-year-old with left leg pain after direct trauma. Uh, the story was that she was watching her grandson's peewee football game, and a bunch of them got, to, it wasn't peewee, it was junior football game, got, a bunch of them got into a tackle and then ran into her helmet right into the proximal lateral leg, right there. So this is her past medical history, as is true of every geriatric patient that we see, is CHF, hypertension, hypercholesterol. Proximal lateral tenderness palpation. The tib fib x-ray is negative. So you do the x-ray, looks fine. Still having pain. Now what? What are we thinking? What's that? Still hurting a lot right in that area. Okay. So tibial plateau fracture. So those are the occult injuries that we can get sometimes when we have pain in that area, direct trauma, often it's caused by peds versus auto. The fender goes right at the tibial plateau and it can break it and about 15 to 20% of the time it's missed on plain films. So definitely you could have a tibial plateau fracture. Cannot miss that fracture. So the plan is you gotta CT it to make sure or you gotta make them non-weight bearing, crutches, et cetera. You know, you know the drill. Now, Older adults, sometimes crutches are very hard to use, so you should probably go ahead and CT it. CT done, it's normal. Neurovascularly intact, the compartments are soft, you are all over this plan. You, you totally understand what's going on. Ligaments seem stable, it's just a soft tissue injury probably. So here's the plan. Ibuprofen 600Q6, weight bearing is tolerated with a walker, rice therapy, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and then return instructions for compartment syndrome. You nailed it. What's wrong with the plan? Anyone? No. What was that? Neurovascular assessment. That would be uh, within the compartment syndrome. Yeah, and we mentioned neurovascularly intact in the previous one. Follow up, okay. Follow up with primary care. Okay, that's one. Let's just assume that we have follow up with primary care. Yeah. Someone said renal function. Why does that matter? Yeah, ibuprofen. Okay, so here's the problem. Whenever you're using scheduled ibuprofen in older adults, it can cause major, major issues, and the number one issue is renal function. 
okay? So labs one month prior to visit, and often we don't have these, right? But this is this patient's labs prior to the visit. <clears throat> that's the one that looks abnormal. Now you see some potassium is a little off, the sodium's a little off, that's the nothing stuff. But that 1.3 in an older woman who's not likely, I didn't describe her as obese, she was a little old lady, 1.3, remember the creatinine is the result of muscle and it, your muscle mass decreases as you get older. So a creatinine of 1.3 in someone who's relatively thin, relatively light, is very, very high. And it doesn't look high, all right? The creatinine clearance is estimated in this patient as 30 milliliters per minute. Normal is greater than 60. You give that person ibuprofen scheduled, or, or PRN, 600 Q6, this person went into renal failure because they used it for a week, 600 Q6 regularly, caused a huge problem, required hemodialysis. Did not die, but it was a very big, very big issue, right, to cause direct tubular necrosis from the, uh, from the ibuprofen. So watch out for those NSAIDs. As an alternative, you should use Tylenol. NSAIDs can not only worsen renal function, but they do all sorts of stuff. Here's why they worsen renal function. Gets better, renal function gets worse with age, as it is. NSAIDs accelerate this. If you have a combined ACE inhibitor with an NSAID, it makes it even worse. It actually accelerates that uh, renal dysfunction. And I described to you that she had hypertension, she had CHF, chances are she was on an ACE inhibitor. Fluid retention that occurs as a result of the renal dysfunction, you get this, this uh, bad uh, vicious cycle where you have the fluid retention because of the renal dysfunction that aggravates the CHF and so on and so forth. And then instead, the best thing to use here is acetaminophen and actually, the recommendations from the geriatric experts are that you use it, use it scheduled, not PRN. Because PRN, sometimes patients will forget or not do it. And if you do acetaminophen scheduled, as long as you're doing it below the uh, maximum daily dose, you'll be good with respect to um, uh, side effects and pain control. And acetaminophen really works. Uh, there's a couple studies by Friedman, uh, who I believe is out of New York City, who has compared head-to-head -head acetaminophen with ibuprofen with musculoskeletal complaints and found that they're exactly the same with a much lower side effect profile for the acetaminophen. So first, first, uh, first tip here, use acetaminophen instead of ibuprofen. Um, NSAIDs can, can worsen, obviously we mentioned CHF, obviously the ulcers, peptic ulcer disease, they can actually be implicated in strokes and then the kidneys, of course. So take on point number one for geriatric emergency medicine, Avoid oral NSAIDs if at all possible. Use acetaminophen instead. There is a role for topical NSAIDs. How many of you guys have heard of Voltaren gel? Some of you may have used that. Some of the geriatricians like to use that. Definitely can use that. There's less systemic absorption. It does work. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a preference thing. Sometimes it's a cost issue. But ordinary standard acetaminophen is quite cheap and works just as well. So, Case number two. 80-year-old man with abdominal pain. The pain's diffuse, because it's always diffuse. Mild or moderate, no other symptoms, no fever. Mild diffuse tenderness, no rebound or, or guarding. What do you do? I heard CT, just, just CT it, just CT it. Oh, but utilization, they're gonna measure how much I see that. No, just CT it, okay, just CT it. Here's why. Here's appendicitis in the non-geriatric adult. This is what we were taught, right? Right lower quadrant pain, this is the non-geriatric adult. Right lower quadrant pain, tenderness at McBurney point, you know, you got tenderness there, you got some anorexia, boom, appendicitis, right? Here's biliary colic. We said right upper quadrant pain, sometimes there's the Murphy sign when you push in and you arrest the respiration, their inspiration there. Um, that's that's uh, biliary colic. Here's diverticulitis, left lower quadrant pain, sort of the right or left-sided appendicitis in a way. Um, where it hurts right there, chances are diverticulitis. And the pancreatitis is kind of epigastric. Here's the older adult. This is what it's like. And those of you who have seen this have seen left lower quadrant pain B, appendicitis, epigastric pain B, diverticulitis, spirally colic, all over, just hurts. Diverticulitis, all over, just hurts. Pancreatitis, all over. How about that? How many of you guys have seen belly pain exclusively as MI? Yeah, I definitely have. You might not see exquisite tenderness, but you don't really see that much tenderness, like exquisite tenderness in older adults. And the re there's multiple reasons for that. Probably the biggest reason is the visceral sensation 
to the organs is just compromised as we get older. So it's very vague. The pain is vague. The somatic sensation, the parietal uh, sensation that we have is also very vague. So it's not as sharp. It just kind of hurts all over and you can't localize it. And the point is in older adults, when their belly hurts, something's going on. And I'll show that to you here. So this is from 1990. This is a long time ago, but um, there's no more recent study that has been done here. Uh, but anything that has been done similar to this, no, no more recent study that's as good, but anything that has been done similar to this has the same findings, which is that when older adults come to the emergency department for abdominal pain, there is something wrong, often surgical. And in, if you look at this, uh, uh, this table here, the top line there says 42% of those required surgery when older adults came to the ED. And that's not emergent surgery, but it is within, within several weeks, if not emergent. And then you can see the causes, biliary is common, SBOs are common, perforated viscous, appendicitis, diverticulitis. I actually uh, put a little note here, I, I, I kind of quantified all the bad things, the stuff that we might get blamed for um, as 61% of these, and then the not so bad stuff that we might not be blamed for is 39%. So the majority of the time someone comes in who's 65 and older with abdominal pain to your ED, they're gonna have something that you have to catch. And it's, and it's way more often than chest pain, with deference to my colleague, Dr. Matu. It's way more often than chest pain that you find something when you're looking. This is why I find one, abdominal pain in older adults to be one of the most satisfying things from a care provider standpoint, is that you can actually find something that's potentially fixable. So here's some not so fun facts about this. So acute cholecystitis, 60% have no back or flank pain at all. 5%, you can have acute cholecystitis and it'd be painless. They just have nausea. 40% of the time, there's a normal white count. And then about one out of six, or a little less, one out of seven, there's no fever or white count or LFT abnormalities. And you can still have acute cholecystitis. So the whole, oh, you have to have a white count to have acute cholecystitis, not true in older adults. White count as well. Leukocytosis in general for older adults, not as commonly seen as younger adults. Appendicitis, three quarters of older adults with appendicitis are afebrile. The majority are afebrile. Abdominal x-ray, this is my uh, man, obligatory rant against the abdominal x-ray, which I think is probably the dumbest test we do. Um, when you do an abdominal x-ray, what are you looking for? Free air, well, it misses it in about 50%. An upright chest x-ray is much better. And SBO, which misses about 40%. And the thing about the abdominal x-ray is, if you're looking at it for SBO, and you know that there's a 40% miss rate, you shouldn't do that test. Well, if you identify the SBO, what do we always do after the obstructive series when we're looking for the SBO and we find it on the obstructive series? We almost always get a CT because we want to know whether it's a closed loop obstruction and we want to know where the inflection point is. So um, the abdominal x-ray, all it can do is lead to problems. My point in, in, in giving you all this information is that CT is the way to go. Malignancy is the number one cause of large bowel obstruction. You can detect this in large part on CT, so it can be seen. CT changes our management a lot in geriatric ED patients. So this is a study done by ESSES, 104 patients, prospective observational study. They didn't do anything, they just watched clinicians and said, hey, wh what do you think the diagnosis is here? Okay, now you're gonna, you did the CT, now what do you think the diagnosis is? And what they find is that you have diagnostic change in 45%, almost one out of every two cases where pay, uh, clinicians thought the diagnosis was X, about half the time they changed it to Y because of the CT. And the certainty of that diagnosis increases, the admission rate increases, or is changed, I should say, the ch is changed. Uh, sur whether or not they need surgery, that changes. Whether or not they need antibiotics, that changes. So CT has massive effect on how we manage these patients. Um, I think the moral of this story is we might be too stingy with CT when we see these patients. So acute abdominal pain, the, of note, this is 60 and over, not just 65 and over, but you get the idea. 337 patients, again, prospective observational. They looked ahead of time and just watched and saw what clinicians did. That's what prospective and observational means. And what they found is that CT was done in 37% of patients, abdominal x-ray in 38%, and ultrasound 9%. CT findings were diagnostic in 57% of patients, 57%. If you're doing uh, CT and it's abnormal 57% of the time that they're ordered, are we doing too many or too few CTs? 
we're doing too few. Our net is not wide enough. Because if more than half the time we find something, chances are we're missing other stuff. So we should do more CTs. Forget about utilization in this regard because you're actually making major changes as a result of management. Again, when I say forget about utilization, we're talking exclusively about geriatric patients. I don't want you guys to go out and say, well, let's just CT all abdominal pain in 20-somethings. 20, 20 That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is 65 and older, CT is the way to go for belly pain. So that should be your default. When you think about a, a geriatric abdominal pain patient, think of that box as pre-checked, and you've got to think of very good reasons to uncheck that CT box, because otherwise you should be doing it. The only exception I could see here is if you did an ultrasound because they had upper quadrant pain, right upper quadrant pain, and you're looking for biliary, col or biliary colic or acute cholecystitis. That would be the only reason I would do an ultrasound first. But if that were negative, I would then do a CT right after that. All right, case number three. 82-year-old man, pedestrian versus auto, struck by a car while crossing the street. Heart rate's 92, blood pressure's 106 over 68, respiratory rate 16, 99% on room air. Doesn't look that bad. P's versus auto is bad, but those vital signs? Anyone worried about those vital signs? Yeah? Oh, some people are worried. And maybe it's because we're at high-risk emergency medicine, but all right. So point of this is those vital signs are bad, and I'll prove it to you. Okay. We know that 70% for trauma, se I'm sorry, 70 year olds and o older for trauma is higher mortality. Makes sense, that's not really that, that groundbreaking. Peds versus auto is the highest mortality. Okay, that also makes sense. Well, I'm, not, I'm not telling you anything that should surprise you right now. Now, this is the best part. This is a study done by Caterino, um, who looked back at a bunch of traumas in the trauma registry and found some interesting facts with where vital sign uh, thresholds are calibrated. And what he found was, Heart rate greater than 90 in geriatric patients was the equivalent in terms of mortality of heart rate greater than 130 in non-geriatric patients. Similarly, systolic pressure in geriatric patients less than 110 was the equivalent of systolic blood pressure less than 95 in non-geriatric, okay? Respiratory rate is inaccurate because we always know it's inaccurate. No one measures it right anyway. So how many people have seen respiratory rate 16 to 18 in every single one of their patients? Almost always, right? It's almost always 16 to 18. So it doesn't, doesn't really help us. Of course, if it's high, then that's a big deal. And that's, you know, that's a big deal. So, all right. So now I gave you this, uh, this uh, scenario. 82-year-old man, pedestrian versus auto, heart rate 92, blood pressure 106 over 68. But I just told you that we need to recalibrate our vital sign thresholds because mortality is different. So now, let's change this to a 52-year-old man. Let's, let's translate what we just learned. 52-year-old man, the heart rate's actually now 134, because remember, greater than 90 is equivalent to greater than 130. So let's call it 134, blood pressure 93 over 68, because the systolic is less than 110. That's equivalent to systolic less than 95. So now, we have a 52-year-old man, pedestrian versus auto, heart rate 134, blood pressure 93 over 68, Rest rate is always 16, and SpO2 99%. This is very concerning. We look at these vital signs, we're like, oh, that looks really bad. When you looked at those first set of vital signs, you're probably like, eh, maybe. All right, let's see what happens. This one almost, te almost certainly tells you this person's in perhaps stage three of hemorrhagic shock already and might need blood. Geriatric patients are under triage and trauma. This is a study by Lehman, another big trauma registry. 51,000 patients, 27% of whom were geriatric. The trauma team activation was 14% for geriatric patients, 29 for non-geriatric. And importantly, anytime a, non, anytime a geriatric patient was under triaged, that conferred a four times mortality rate, 4X. So as we just saw, the vital signs are off, they get under triaged and they're much more injured than they, than they appear. And so we want to make sure that we look at those vital signs differently in geriatric patients. And anyone who's old, over 70, that's a higher mortality to begin with. As we know, of course, we know this, but we still miss it. And this is done in 2009. So uh, C-spine evaluation for trauma, uh, the number one uh, C-spine injury that occurs in geriatric patients is C1, C2 devastating injuries, this'll, this'll uh, kill people. Um, and then non-geriatric patients, C6, C7, about half of them. So the higher injuries are more common in geriatric patients. 
Importantly, if you're using the Canadian C-spine rules, you cannot in geriatric patients. They excluded 65 and older. Doesn't work. New Orleans criteria excluded 60 and older. Those don't work. The Nexus do work. The Nexus criteria do work, but only 9% of their population was geriatric. So Nexus criteria was sensitive, can be used, but just remember the prevalence of the population was lower than our typical uh, geriatric population. If you guys are in a general ED, your geriatric patient population is anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Anyone higher than 20 percent? Anyone know? I work in Florida, um, in Tampa, and one of our uh, partner hospitals there has a 41 percent geriatric uh, population, so pretty high. So, well, moral of the story with C-spine evaluation, you can use Nexus, but if your thoughts about doing the CT are greater than one, you should just do the CT. If you're thinking about it, just do it in older adults. You can use Nexus, but plain films don't tell you that much. They're a little bit uh, misleading, and you don't often get adequate views, so you should just go right to CT. All right. Uh, quick note on anticoagulation and head trauma. There's more space in the skull. That's why you get asymptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. You can have a big bleed sitting there, and there'll be virtually no clinical signs of that. 10% of head trauma patients, just all comers, are on warfarin or some other kind of anticoagulant. And then about one out of every six asymptomatic head injury patients. Asymptomatic, if you're on warfarin, you have an intracranial hemorrhage. This is the reason why if you hit your head and you're on an anticoagulant, specifically warfarin, but it could be extended to others, if, you're, if you hit your head and you're on an anticoagulant, you should get a CT. And no aspirin doesn't really count. That doesn't count as an anticoagulant. And then there's 6% delayed bleeding with minor head trauma. So you don't, you, you get a minor head trauma, you get a CT head, it's normal, and they've done studies to look, look back at these later and say, hey, we, we repeated the CT because we were worried about something or other, and about 6% of them do have a delayed bleed. The clinical significance of that, unclear. It's a little bit unclear about how you would manage someone with a delayed bleed, how big those are and stuff. Yes, there's a question here. Yeah, good question. The question was, how do you um, handle Berlinta or Plavix, so some of the uh, platelet inhibitors? And the answer is, it is mostly clinical judgment. Most people think that aspirin, Plavix, and Berlinta fall into a category of non-true anticoagulants, but there's dosage-related uh, issues there as well. I mean, if you're using Plavix at 300, that's different from Plavix at 75. If you're using aspirin at 324, that might be different from 81. So there's a clinical judgment involved there. Okay, so take home point number three, recalibrate your vital sign thresholds in trauma. Don't forget, those subtle findings in geriatric patients mean a lot. Case number four, 82-year-old female, left wrist pain after foosh, fall and outstretched hand. No syncope or head trauma, I just, I lost my balance. How'd you fall? I lost my balance. Did you pass out? No, I didn't. I just, I just fell. I don't know what happened. I just fell. Occasionally uses a walker, lives alone. Is this a high-risk situation? Yeah, falls are bad, Okay. Uh, about a third of community dwellers fall every year, 60% of SNF residents fall every year, and two-thirds of those who fall will fall again within six months. The number one cause of death due to injury is from fall. The number one injurious deaths are due to fall in the geriatric population. There's a 10% chance of a hip fracture in falls by age 85, and there's a 25% mortality within six months after a hip fracture. 25%. So I'm going to put this in perspective here. So six-month mortality. So when you think of hip fractures and how bad that is, how bad of a stat that is, look at the mortality of common really bad conditions that we know. So sepsis, yeah, that's bad. 20 to 50% mortality. If you're in multi-organ organ dysfunction, that's really bad in sepsis, especially in geriatric patients. Cancer with brain mets, 50%. Okay, those two put in a separate category of the absolute worst mortality coming up. But Hip fracture at 25% above MI, pneumonia, tied uh, with the worst CHF, and then tied with the worst end-stage renal disease. It's bad. It's a harbinger of really high mortality, and anytime someone falls and breaks their hip, if they're over 65, you have a big problem. It's actually a case for trying to get these patients into surgery quickly and out and rehab very fast. That's really, really important. How many of you work at institutions that have hip fracture programs where the goal is to get folks in and out of surgery very quickly? Anyone have one? 
I've seen them more and more. It, there's about three or four that every, every lecture that I give, um, I, see, I see more and more of these. But the orthopedists have now recognized this as, as a major problem, and hopefully your institution, this will come soon, these geriatric fracture programs. So um, one, one thing that's really important, anytime an older adult falls, watch them walk afterwards. Give them their standard walking device. If they use a walker, give them the walker. If they use a cane, give them the cane, cane but let them walk. Watch them walk. If you don't watch them walk, you're going to have another fall, and it could be devastating. And then don't discharge them if they have poor balance without a plan. So take home point number four, high mortality for a hip fracture. People will fall and break their hips, and if they do, there's a one out of four chance they're going to be dead within six months. It's no joke. It's real. So treat falls is a very high-risk event. All right, last case. 85-year-old female with fatigue and altered mental status. Not acting herself, kind of failure to thrive, not eating, 994, 95, 16, 102 for 62, 99% of room air. And that's the past medical. What's going on here? What's the problem? That 99.5 is real. It's real. Two-thirds of septic patients who are admitted are geriatric. It makes sense. Older adults, more comorbid comorbidities, more severe infection. Not, not really that surprising. However, they tend to have atypical symptoms. We call them atypical, but if two-thirds of the admissions are geriatric, those are the typical patients. Those are more common. So geriatric patients who have sepsis are afebrile half the time. Half the time, afebrile. And the reason they're afebrile is because the baseline temperature for geriatric patients, not septic, just baseline temperature, non-septic patients, baseline temperature for older adults is 97.3. You know how people would say, you know, people say, oh, I, I kind of run low. My temperature runs low. I never get a real fever. That's a real fever. That is actually true in older adults. They've done this on healthy people, and their baseline temp runs 97.3, which is 1.3 degrees less than our standard 98.6. So they do run low, and 99.5 is real. You don't have to have a real 101 point or 100.4 temperature to make this happen. And SIRS and QSOFA, how many of you guys have heard of QSOFA? It, it got, some, got some press for a while and then quickly died down as they found it wasn't as good as SIRS. Uh, both SIRS and QSOFA have less than 70% sensitivity to pick up sepsis in older adults, okay? So moral of the story is that fever doesn't have to be a real fever. Just kind of a little bit of a temperature is, is fine, and think of their baseline as 97.3, and then recalibrate that vital sign in your head and think, could this person be septic? And the, the, the fact is, when they're, act, when they're acting goofy, if they're failure to thrive, if they're not acting right, they're not eating, sepsis is way high up there as a list of possibilities. Do not forget. And their mortality is higher if you don't treat it. And sepsis is one of those things where we in the emergency department, if we don't act and recognize quickly and give antibiotics quickly, mortality increases. So we, when we talk about we're in the ED saving lives, this is how we save lives, recognizing and treating sepsis appropriately. So um, interestingly, when you look at uh, survival of, of, uh, of patients with uh, mean arterial pressures, you find that in older adults, a lower goal of MAP, so 65 is the max mean arterial pressure, is actually better. Unclear, unclear why this is, but um, but you don't have to go for a goal map of, of 70 or 75 using pressors. If you hit 65, you're doing okay. Okay, so sepsis doesn't need a real fever, does not. You can have sepsis in older adults without a fever, have a low threshold for using antibiotics, and a first dose of antibiotics is not a big deal. When you continue them long term, fine. If, if, they don't, if they're not septic and you keep giving four or five, six doses of it, fine but you should have a low threshold to give, even broad spectrum antibiotics in older adults. So let's go ahead and summarize. So take home points, avoid the NSAIDs, use acetaminophen instead, make CT the default. So go ahead and get the CT for belly pain patients unless you have a clear right upper quadrant pain that you're looking for biliary colic. But if that's normal, go with the CT after that. Recalibrate the vital sign thresholds in trauma. That heart rate of 99, 90, 95, big deal. That systolic blood pressure of 105, that's a big deal too. So watch out for that. Treat falls as a high risk event, make them walk. If someone falls, get, let, get them up and walking to make sure they're not high risk for falling again. 
And then sepsis doesn't need an actual fever. Remember, their baseline temp is 97.3, so treat anything above that, significantly above that, as a real fever. All right? And then hopefully, hearing some of the stories of those pretty amazing older adults, it'll help you appreciate your geriatric patients a bit more. So, great. Any questions for me? Happy to take them now. If not, you can call me, you can text me, you can email me, and then you can go to lunch. <laughs>